Hello? That worked? Can you hear me? Mom's in the front row, <laughs> grading me. No pressure. <laughs> I'm going to teach mom some things today. Yeah, right. Praise the Lord. Is it always, is it me? Usually when these requests come, they come late and when you're really busy and, you know, that's usually what happens. I, I'm getting used to it, I think. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate it. Pastor Matt, sorry. Should we pray? Are you, everybody ready? I got a coffee coming, so, I, you know, I can't preach without coffee. The second anointing. Lord Jesus, I just thank you for your perfect plan, always somehow guiding us in the craziness of life, the planning, the details the craziness of our mind, somewhere way back there. You are a steady ship, guiding us, leading us, whether we know it or not. And we're just so thankful for your presence and your truth. And in our hearts is excitement because of the word and because of convention and because of seeing each other. And we are just happy to be partaking here in this church, loving you and being loved by you. And just bless this morning, specifically this class, and give us something, something special from your mind today. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, the chap the, uh, this is the wonderful book, right, that you're doing this week? Or, or I'm a little bit in the dark, but I was told this is what you've been hearing about. I have read all but, I've had every chapter. No, I've read no chapters except the chapter I'm supposed to preach on. Oh, warnings to the church. Yes, so, so I feel a little bit like, you know, I wonder what the rest of the book says, <laughs> you know, but it's really good so far, so I just haven't gotten to reading at all. I just, just started, so. Um, but on the other hand, uh, um, it's about uh, the church. So uh, for me, that's uh, just an amazing subject, right? Body life, the church. Uh, what, a, what an amazing subject to talk about, probably something that we never We'll stop talking about, you know. This is Liam, by the way, who's bringing me my coffee. Ready? This is uh, what I do. I'm a youth leader, and I abuse <laughs> my authority, boss people around, teenagers around. Mm. Wow. That's European style strong. <laughs> okay, so the body of Christ, the church, what a beautiful thing, what a beautiful thought. And I just had some time this morning and thinking about uh, what, um, what is being said in the book. And the, the thought, the verse, of course, comes to one that we all know, often quoted, Matthew chapter 16. The exchange, the wonderful exchange with Peter, um, where Jesus says to him in verse 18, Matthew 16, 18, I say unto thee, this is Jesus talking. I just like to think about it for a second. You know, this is Jesus. This is God saying to a human being who happens to be Peter that Peter is not the subject matter, really. Not, not that's the distraction for some people, but it's not really about Peter. This is Jesus saying, um, "Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it." The book uh, just wonderfully breaks it down into five different sections, and maybe we'll do a little bit of that and read a little bit, I don't know, but maybe the first thing we can just talk about is the, the word church, you know. Um, a, a word that is uh, insignificant in this world. A, world, a word that means nothing in this world. Um, 
you know, it's, it's, like, it's like last on the list of vocabulary knowledge if you are living in this world, you know. Um, it is not important, even for Christians, sometimes a, a sideshow, something that you do when you have some time or go to when it's Easter. Uh, it's a word that uh, is small, with no impact, insignificant. Uh, but then, um, for some of us, it's like a huge word, uh, maybe one of the biggest words, you know, in our vocabulary, a gigantic part of our lives. Um, it, it means a whole world to us. When we think of church, we don't think of the building, of course. We don't think of the chapel. We don't think of anything small like that. We're thinking of something much bigger. And uh, what's shocking is that the world doesn't recognize it and doesn't seek it and doesn't want it and dismisses it. Uh, there's a page 11 on this book. Maybe I'll read it. Brethren, the children of this world take little or no interest in the building of this church. They care little for conversions or souls. What are broken spirits and penitent hearts to them? I mean, that's, that's a, I love that. What, when you say the church, what do you think of? You know, broken spirits, humble people. You're excluding yourself, but you're thinking of humble people broken spirits, people that are worshiping God, and the church has no idea. It is all foolishness in their eyes. For while the children of the world care nothing, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God. For the preserving of the church, the laws of nature have oftentimes been suspended. For the good of the church, all the providential dealings of God in this world are ordered and arranged. For the elect's sake, wars are brought to an end and peace is given to a nation. Statesmen, rulers, emperors, kings, presidents, heads of government have their schemes and plans and think of them as vastly important. You ever think of your own plan as being important, you know, your own world? But there is another work going on of infinite greater significance for what they are all but the axes and, sa and saws in God's hand. You know, it's, it's amazing to think if we could just name some world leaders, you know. Um, we have Biden, we have Putin, we have all these world leaders, and they are just tools, just tools in God's hand being thrown around at his will, you know, and used on the behalf of the church which is hard to believe and hard to think of. But I remember Pastor Mati years ago said that, that Boeing 747s were created for the church. And the world is just benefiting from that invention. And uh, Roman roads were built, right, for Paul, uh, for the gospel's sake. So why not a Boeing 747? And some guy long ago, the Wright brothers, thought they had a brilliant idea, a brilliant scheme. And, uh, you know, God has had a, had a bigger plan in mind, you know. Um, this part I love. How little are we told in God's world about unconverted men compared to that of the believers? Think of the history of Nimrod. A few words in the Bible, Nimrod, right? And chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter about Abraham, right? Uh, what about Alexander the Great? Where is he in the Bible? There's a vague mention possibly about him, right? The world is all about Alexander the Great and the history and all the great Greeks and all the philosophers and all the sculptures and all the beauty. I, mean, I just went to Greece a year ago and it's just like magnificent to people in this world. But there's almost no mention of it in the Bible. You know, there's no mention of these people. Uh, but there is mention of Joseph chapter after chapter after chapter. And Pastor Schaller said it a long time ago, the only history that counts is the history of the church. 
the only history that really needs to be recorded is the history of the, of the church. The only history that matters is the history of the church. It's the most significant thing on this planet. The real story that is happening here. And I think what I do love about this church specifically is body life, you know. To us, it is so important. Pastor Stevens really had a rhema from God, I think, about body life. He really saw something that didn't exist so often in, 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 in so many places about the church. And from that concept, from this kind of view, uh, body life arose. You know? If it is important to us, if we recognize God's view of the church, then it becomes very important to us. If it's important to God, it becomes important to us. And if it's important to us, then it becomes a huge part of our life. And a Sunday morning will not suffice for us. It becomes something much bigger than us. And Christ obviously thought it as extremely important. I mean, I always like to think of it this way. You know, the Trinity is sitting around, and they say, okay, we got this idea, we got this plan, you know. And, uh, you know, we got Adam and Eve, we got, the, we got Calvary, and then we're going to have something called a group of people. And they're going to be, uh, you know, the saved group of people that believe in me. And what shall we call them? And Jesus is sitting there. What shall we call them? And Jesus raises his hand. You know. Let's call them my body. Let's, let's get the message to them as clearly as we possibly can that they are as close to me as my body. They are as part of me as my body. Um, out of all the names he could have picked, and, and other names are used, of course, the name that we love and the name that Jesus picked is his body. That Christ is the fullness of God and that we are the fullness of Christ. And that, and that, and that you know, the oneness that is implied by just titling what we are is amazing. And of course he uses, you know, uh, sheep, He's a shepherd of, of us as, as sheep, and he uses soldiers, and uh, he uses um, the bride, another great, wonderful title, to try to get it through to us that we are extremely precious and extremely important. And when Adam was born, when Adam was created, sorry, you know, that wonderful little word that says, you know, you know God saw and God recognized that it was not good that he was alone. You know, I don't think it came to him like shock, like surprisingly, like like God is part of the Trinity, and he knew very well that Adam should never be alone. But just the wording in the Bible, you know, makes it sound like oh, this is a mistake. We got to change it, change it up a little bit. But that that little that little sentence gives us a clue that man was not created to be alone. Uh, that man uh, needed to be part of something. You know, you have that word, um, fear of missing out, FOMO, right, FOMO, right? That is a natural uh, result of how God created me. Um, I don't want to miss out. I want to be part of something. And uh, we see it very evidently in the world, of course, but also even in, in, in my own heart or, you know, in the church. And when God created Adam, uh, he made him... Uh, f with certain intention, that there was a certain plan, and that plan was that he would be part of something, that the brain that Adam had would be used and would be influenced by the mind of Christ in such a way that it would contribute to a greater plan and a greater idea and a greater group of people, and that the emotions that God created in Adam uh, would be used and, and, and heightened or enlightened by, by the love of God you know, um, and that the will would be used uh, uh, only to be subjected to God's will, all within, really, if you think about it, within the church. And instead, we have an independent mind away from God, and our minds were never meant to be independent from God, and instead we use our, our emotions for everything else but what God intended them to be. We we prostitute our emotions in a thousand different directions. When in reality, they were created for us to love people. 
in the body and in the, wor in the, in the lost in the world, you know. And, um, you know, what's so beautiful about the plan of redemption is that um, we are back to God's intended thought, intended ways through Christ. Christ has made it possible for us to live a life in the body and, and you know, obviously not perfectly, but our minds are being enhanced again by the mind of Christ and our emotions are now again being filled with God's love. And most of us probably in this room have been in a situation where you know that you are living not of some love in your heart that you created or that you have managed to muster up, but that God put in you, you know. And, I, and if, you, if you have a ministry in your life, then that is extremely clear. It's extremely clear. It's extremely clear to me that I had, I had zero love for teenagers, and then all of a sudden something happens. <laughs> I actually love teenagers. I actually love Liam. Uh, I know, tell me, that's a, that's a miracle. No. So, so, you know, in God's perfect plan, my emotions are curbed and filtered and changed and redirected and also enhanced and, and awoken to proper emotions of laying down my life for other people or, or, you know, or loving the body, loving the unlovable, you know. And... Um, um, and of course, you know, we fail and, and, and nothing's perfect in that area, but we know for sure that the will was never meant to be really independent, and, but it was meant to be part of a plan and part of a ministry and part of a church and part of a body subjected to God's will. And uh, independence is the doctrine of Satan. It, 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 it doesn't belong in the body. Actually, it doesn't belong anywhere. It doesn't work so well in marriage. And actually, it doesn't work in business either. You know, uh, the business world loves the word team, team you know. That's a very overused word in, in, uh, in business. And uh, in, uh, right now, there's a world, world European, uh, European soccer. And, you know, a big word in European soccer right now in, in Europe is um, uh, team, you know. And if you're not a team, then you may not win the cup, actually. And some teams are known for not being a good team, like Holland. <laughs> have a reputation of losing soccer games because they're so independent. Um, so it doesn't really work anywhere. Of course it doesn't work anywhere because God created us and God put it in us to not be independent, but to submit and to live in a body. And autonomy is a evil philosophy that the world loves and Satan puts in our heart, you know. And rebellion uh, is, is straight from Satan and uh, we resist it. But um, we love our church. Our, uh, Stefan Stein, a long time ago, maybe seven years ago, said that, that uh, church is a divine appointment. It's where I live my life one way I'm doing this all the wrong ways, using, using my brain the wrong way, using my emotions the wrong way, using my will the wrong way, and I'm doing this independently on my own, in my own little world, making things that are imp uh, not important, extremely important, like my house or my car or my vacation. And I'm living this thing and I'm doing this thing and I'm somehow able to pull it together, or at least make believe I pull it together, although some people need, need a lot of alcohol to make it work, you know, or drugs or other things or continuously new things, you know. But I'm kind of living this life over here and doing my little thing. And then one day, I go to church and my life changes. And I see my church the way God sees my church. And I start to have a different eyesight. And it's no longer John, who's an idiot sitting next to me, who you just want to slap half the time, but a body member sitting next to me. And it's no longer the guy on stage who has some good opinions once in a while. And yeah, I like the way he talks, but um, that guy becomes your pastor. I had that, uh, 12, 13 teenagers uh, at my house Tuesday night, and it was amazing, wasn't it? 
and we could say that really, because they were last year's graduating class, so a year ago they graduated, so they were at my house. So I'm kind of wondering if they even want to come, because they don't want anything to do with the youth ministry anymore. They're old and, you know, moving along. And also wondering if anything has happened, you know, like when we dropped them off a cliff. For some, anyways, many of them are in Bible college and doing awesome. And I'm always a little worried and wondering. And, and we sat and, around the fire and had an amazing time, unbelievable. I didn't say anything. Um, they, we went around the room, and Liam was amazing. And God, Liam is in a tent in the army in Finland, and he is reading his Bible, and he's getting to know God. And he is becoming a body member. And one of the girls said that I learned this year that Pastor Schaller is my shepherd. And I'm like melting inside. I'm going, oh my gosh, this is amazing. This is exactly what I begged God for, you know, what we prayed so hard for when you were seniors. The whole church is praying for you every day. And what are we really praying? Except could they get to know Jesus in the body of Christ? And when, when she said that, I almost cried. You know, it was like, oh my gosh. There is a Holy Spirit, and he is doing a work. And it does, it, we did have an impact, and the, the church did work. And Pat Lynch and Jen Lynch and Pastor Barry and the teachers, they, they did teach something. And Pastor Love at camp, you know, so, um, you know. Uh, and another one said, um, you know, what I learned today is I really need the church. I think two people said that in different ways. They said, I really need the church. I need to be here. I realized this is... Imagine, you, you, some of you probably know, but you grow up in the church and you're just filled with familiarity. You're, just, you have, you have, you have, you're laced with familiarity, the cancer familiarity. You've, you grew up hearing preaching and, and learned how to dismiss 90% of it, if not 99% of it. You learned how to sit in church without knowing a single word that was being said. And, and, and here, here they are, 19 years old, saying, you know what, I'm going to church and I need it. I need it. It's such a blessing to me. I really need it. So, um, so the church is such a beautiful concept that came from the mind of God, a mystery, uh, something that we love so much that is so dear to us that in a way is holy ground. It's holy ground. And we are careful. We try to be careful. We, we make mistakes sometimes, but we try to be very careful about how we think, how we criticize, how we see each other, uh, what we do, what we say, there's a filter because love is constraining us. And um, the, the, all the laws have been replaced by one law, which is love. And in the body, we're like, okay, you know, you know, you get like maybe you have a tense moment between two people in the body, you know, and, or there's a disagreement or potential, you know, knockout, blowout fight. <laughs> or whatever, you know, difficulties. And in the back of our minds, we say, okay, fine, but I gotta be careful here. I gotta be careful because this is God's church. And it was a gift to me, the divine appointment for me. And I'm gonna tiptoe. I'm gonna be careful. I'm gonna work circumspectly. I'm going to endeavor. What, make a list what it takes to be endeavoring. Just make a list. What do I do to, what does it mean when Paul says endeavor? Uh, how do I treat my body members? How do I operate in the church? What do I do? What is my role? What does Jesus want me to do? And it, and it changes the way we live in the church because of the high level that we give it in our lives. And of course, uh, you know, you know we, I mean, Pastor Gary Grunwald years ago in, in Budapest said that uh, church is vertical. Church life, body life is vertical, you know. It's me and Jesus that, that, that adds to the church. Um, it's not that I get everything from the church horizontally, but as I have my relationship with Christ, and as that increases, I add to the, to the body. And, and that's a, a beautiful thought also. Um, let's see, another point he said, let's see, that Christ builds it. Christ built the church. Now, I'm in business, so I can't help but go to work on Thursday and then come here on Friday and see vastly different way of operating. It's very, I mean, you do too. You, you work and live in the world. But I, I, you know, I'm running this organization and I'm trying to 
I have goals and I'm trying to make money and I'm trying to organize and computer systems and people and and I always say this but in the in the world in the in the business I God gives me the illusion that I'm in control my name is on the company I built it I did it my decisions got me here you know now I've learned uh, in, in thank God in recent years that actually that's just an illusion that God's in control but uh, for sure you know he seems to leave me alone a lot more you know uh, it feels like that to me I can't help it it feels like that to me but I have never felt uh, that way about the church I've never felt that oh I, I'm the one running camp I got this you know or I'm the run running youth minister I'm the one going on a mission trip with the kids um, you know uh, I, I've never felt uh, qualified enough, capable enough, knowledgeable enough, smart enough. Um, and I've never felt that my communication skills were up to par. Uh, I've never felt that this game uh, works within my own means and within my own experience, and within my own uh, intellect or lack of it. And uh, I love that. I just love that. Christ builds the church. It is, it is a lot less pressure. It's a lot less pressure. You know, I had to really learn how to, how to give my business to God and, and, get, and, let, and, get, and have God. I'm still learning how to let God r rule my life over there. You know? But I loved that in my life became this huge, ask, this, huge, this huge percentage of my life. It was like, oh, there's no way I'm doing this without God. Like, I'm not going to do this without praying my way through it. And, because God does it, and God builds the church. And, uh, you know, uh, Pastor Schaller, um, was it, I don't remember, two weeks ago talked about uh, the, the cart, the ark is on the cart. Just a quick devotional. I don't know if he spoke about it after that or preached about it because I was away, but um, it's just a beautiful 10-minute devotional about the fact that, you know, the, the ark gets put on the cart and it's going to Jerusalem and then, you know, let's get it up there. Let's just get it up to Jerusalem, you know. And nah, -uh. drop dead, right? And that's, that's the church, you know. You cannot push the ark to Jerusalem in the church. You're not, you cannot create church with your own effort. You cannot use your muscles and your strength and your ability and your experience to do this game. You will fall dead to the ground spiritually. Or the work will not work, you know. Or it will work at a different, in a different way, you know. It could be like a dead church or, um, or a humanistic church or a, a good works church, you know. Um, to get God to Jerusalem, you know, to push the ark, you need Jesus, you know. It's a, it, you, he, you know, he builds the church. He builds the church. He is the foundation. What an incredible foundation, incredible foundation. Maybe I can read that part. I like that part in page 12, if I can find it. Let's see, my brother, our foundation was laid at a very mighty cost. The foundation of the church is Calvary, right? Um, No other foundation but this could ever have borne the weight of the church. Like, no way, no way. You, you can't make this happen. I mean, you know, you can't make this happen. Even from a practical perspective, you couldn't make it work. Like, you know, what I have at the business is cash. That's how I create team life. Cash, paychecks, right? I am able to get a lot done in my business because of big fat paychecks. If I pull the paychecks away, the whole thing is a house of cards collapses in about 24 hours. 25 years of work will collapse in 24 hours if I say, hey, I got no money this week. It would just be, it'd just be disaster. All those friends you thought you had, all those hardworking people, you know, just walk away, right? Um, like, it cannot happen that way. But yet, look at our, look at our church, look at the church, you know, it, it works here, and it definitely doesn't work with cash. Uh, the few people that do get, get paid around here get paid, you know, pathetically sm small amounts of money that would make you almost 
think that, you know, it's better not to get paid. But, you know, but yet, look what's happening. You know, some kind of motivation, some kind of moving in our hearts. And people work very, very hard for very little money, happily, most of the time, with joy in our hearts, you know. Uh, look at our leaders traveling, working night and day, teaching classes, you know, n everything's on the table, very little time for themselves. And we've always had these kind of leaders that, you know, that did this and so many great examples in our, in our church laying down their lives, you know, because Christ is building it and Christ is doing it inside, you know. And he's the foundation and he's, you know, he's the one that prevents burnout, you know. No other foundation but this could have borne the weight of the church. No other foundation could have met the necessities of a world of sinners. The, the foundation of, once obtained is very strong. It can bear the weight of sin of all the world. It has borne the weight of all the sins of all the believers who have built on it. Sins of thought, sins of imagination, sins of the heart, sins of the head, sins of everyone sins that everyone has seen, and sins which no man knows, sins against God, sins against man, sins of all kinds and descriptions that the mighty rock can bear. This is just a, a, a wonderful concept for us in this church, that it's Jesus. And we recognize it when we see it, and we miss it when it's not there. And our source, our motivation, our thoughts, everything. He is the one that did it. He's the one that built it. He's the one that gives the credit. And uh, he's the one that makes it happen. And if it wasn't him, then it wouldn't work. I'm telling you, it wouldn't work. I, I don't believe it would work. Uh, I heard of a church uh, that paid their, pays their youth leader $80,000 a year. And, uh, and it's near my house. And uh, it's tempting, you know. Now... Uh, like, I'm just, I'm just saying, like, it wouldn't work. I don't believe it would work, you know. And uh, money is, is, is not present. It's, the, it's, it's God. He's the foundation. And he uses his agent, and he, uh, he infiltrates our lives and puts something in our hearts and puts us on display. Uh, you know, like, he, he, is, he is making us trophies of grace, you know. Uh, Ephesians 1, like trophies of grace, like he is shining through us in the church and making us Christ-like for the church's sake. Um, and despite the fact that the foundation is his, another point is that he does use us. He does use us. And I've always thought that this was the greatest, greatest, you know, blunder that God could have ever made, the greatest bottleneck that has ever existed, you know. Um, you know, uh, in World War II, they had the, the idea to invade Europe, you know, on D-Day, and uh, the problem was, how do you take this massive army of England and this massive army of America and funnel it through a tiny beach front, Omaha Beach, into Europe, right? Uh, so that was very difficult, and they were successful at a very high price. But, like, I just think of God, God saying, here's how I'm going to do this. I'm going to use Liam. And I'm going to use Liam in a tent in Finland, freezing cold winter somewhere. And people are going to walk by the tent and see him reading his Bible. And that's going to be the seed that changes that guy's life 10 or 20 years from now or whenever, you know. And we would say, like, that's, that's a horrible idea. How about you show up instead, Lord? Or send an angel or do something. There's got to be some better plan. But he has decided to use me and, me and you, uh, crazy as, this, as that plan may be. Uh, the way he puts it is um, uh, condescending. I'm trying to think of it. I, can, I wrote it down. But condescending condescending plan, condescending subject, you know, like the great God condescending himself to our level and using his great plan and his great mind and his great words and his great thoughts and his great grace and his great love and saying, I'm going to shine all of this through this guy, Liam. 
And guess what? It works. It really, really works. That everything that God is shines <coughs> through Liam. Everyone's going to want to talk to Liam afterwards, get a little shine. <laughs> I already know this. Some of you might know this, but I already knew this about you. But I'm just saying, like, you know, uh, it is quite mystical. It's quite mystical. You know, in business, we look for stars. We look for superstars. I look for, I'm interviewing right now. Like, every week I'm interviewing, trying to, for three months interviewing. What am I looking for? A superstar. Guy, man after man is dismissed. Like, you know, resume after resume. Nope, 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 nope. You're no good. You're no good. You're no good. You're no good. Three months, maybe 20 people. Forget about it. You, you don't cut the mustard. Uh, and then I get the one I want. He's got all the qualities, all the abilities, you know, you know, whatever, you know. And then you hire, right? You look for strong, capable people. That's a good plan. Not, but not our God. In the church, he looks for weak people, right? Weak people, broken people. Mystical. It's mystical. You, you know, you got to think of that as the most craziest plan, the craziest idea, you know. So, it is. He, uh, I wrote this down. The rising of the sun does not extinguish the stars, right? Madame Guyon said that it doesn't extinguish it. We are stars. We are God's creation. He made us. We're made in his image. And we are, we can be pretty amazing on a good day, right? But we do shine a little bit from, a, from the right angle on the right day. Look what I did today. But when the sun rises, it just, they disappear. Not, they're still there. They're still, they didn't move, right? And they're still shining. But the light is so bright that, that we disappear in that light, right? All right, so um, one more point, which is the gates of hell come against it. The gates of hell. It says the gates of hell will not prevail. It doesn't say the gates of hell won't, you know, won't, uh, won't attack, you know. It's, 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 it says the opposite, is that the gates of hell will come against it, but they will not prevail. And I think that in Christianity, we would like to think that uh, because I'm a Christian, the gates of hell will not come against me. You know, they will not, they, I will not have the, the trials, but um, the government of Satan has a plan, and he wants to come against body life. And everything he does, I think, is to destroy the individual in the body or the body uh, as a whole. And every plan for 6,000 years has been that plan. How can I destroy the church? How can I destroy the individual in the church, and how can I destroy the, 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 uh, the church? And uh, in the book it says, Cain will go on murdering Abel forever. He's, that's when it started and it'll never end. And um, he is always looking to divide us and always looking to put those little crazy seed thoughts and always looking to like, figure out a way where we can have a disagreement and get, you know, and get upset and trying to see if you can get a foot in somewhere and stirring the pot non nonstop, stirring it up and trying to create emotions and trying to create you know, some kind of reason for division. With, with every effort of his being, this is his plan. Um, he will oppose us. And, um, you know, we were in the paper, right, a couple months ago. And I know some of us were like, well, it's been a while since we've been in the paper. <laughs> and some of us were like, yeah, un unaffected. I mean, I just, I don't, I think I can speak for most people and just totally unaffected by bad reports in the paper. Why? We're used to it. It was told to us that this would happen. If we're doing any good whatsoever, then the gates of hell will, will do their best to do, to do their thing and shut us down and make us look bad. And, and, and um, you know, and sometimes I remember one person once asked me, are you worried about all these people, ex-members that don't, you know? Not really. I, I would be more worried if everything was smooth and everything was good. Based on this verse alone, it seems that, you know, there is warfare. A lot of warfare. And the opposition is being stirred up against us. And millions of ungodly men have been agents of Satan against the church, from governments to generals to people to Christians, uh, have been used to undermine the church. And uh, um, he will never stop. And it won't end. And if anything, it's going to get worse. And I think we all have that idea in the American churches. It's, it's not going to get any better. It's going to get worse, and we're okay with it. Uh, why? Because of the next part. They will not prevail. 
it will not prevail. It will survive. It has survived. Despite us, the church thrives, moves around, flourishes in one country, darkens in another country, moves to the next country. You know, it just goes on and on and on and on. And uh, if, if not in England, then in America, and not in America, then in China. You know, like, it's going to keep going. And what a wonderful promise. What an, um, what an everlasting promise. You know, when God made Adam, he made us for eternity. And we have evidence in us that we know that we are made for eternity. We would never suffice with temporal love, right? Like I was uh, preaching, to, doing a wedding, and Seth said, says, uh, till death do, do us part, right? He says it to Sam, till death do us part. What if, what if Seth had said, I love you, I make my vows to you for 10 years? Disaster, right? Like, disaster. All right, all right, fine, 20. 20 is the ma max you can get out of me, 20. You can't ask me to give more than 20 years of love. Disasters. Sam walks off, you know, crying, you know, like, it doesn't work. We were not made for temporal love. We were made for eternal love. And we were not made for our temporal word that, that disappears, you know. We were made for an eternal word. We, if this word was, was really, really good but not eternal, eh, you know, it's, it's every bone in my body knows that if it's eternal, then it really means something. It can be good stuff, but if it's eternal, every bone in my body is like, holy cow, for the rest of eternity, this word lasts, you know? And if grace was temporary, then it wouldn't be grace at all. It would just be a, uh, you know. I mean, if at the end of grace there is judgment, what would grace become to us but a joke, a sarcastic joke? Oh, great. Enjoy it while it lasts, you know. Every bone in my body was made for eternity. And it's very clear to me. And the world has no, I, no reason to explain to me why I was made for eternity and why that's, that's so big for me. So, so the church is eternal, too. The church is eternal. And the gates of hell will never prevail against it. Amen? Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Ten, ten, 10, 15 minutes, uh, a coffee break, right?
Yeah. Okay. Uh, also, do I have an iPad uh, for this class? Okay, good uh, morning. Good morning. <laughs> this is our... Have you picked up on our theme for these classes from uh, Riles, Bishop Riles' book, Warnings to the Churches? And I was thinking in the last class, Pastor Mike Plunkett has done mission work in China. And undoubtedly, it runs through his mind like are any of the brothers and sisters in the leadership of the churches in China, uh, could they fall away? Has that come across your mind, Pastor Mike? Uh, it does come across their mind because uh, it's in the scripture. And it's a real warning by the, from the Lord. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, right? What does that mean, Brian? Okay, so we have the the definition of the Pharisee and the Sadducee is what how Brian answered my question. All right, so before, let's start by just having a very worshipful, uh, trusting attitude toward God. And Lord, we need you for this class and more to give us the warnings regarding church uh, life for believers falling away, falling away. They just, they just fall away from the faith. They get very discouraged. They can get beguiled, tricked, deceived, misled, hurt, empty, and use these thoughts, Lord, in your name we pray, Jesus' name, amen. Um, I think I'm going to speak for five or seven minutes and then give you the time to kind of work at your desk a little bit with somebody sitting next to you, because I think you'll get a lot out of the class if we do that. And so um, how many have a book with you from Bishop Ryle? Just show me the book. Anybody? Okay. All right. So good. Liam's got Liam is our guest, special guest for the week. He's a Finnish soldier, American, half Finnish, his mom's Finnish. He's been in the Finnish army this past year. When he came to service Wednesday night, he said, this is like going to a rock concert. Because <laughs> I've been watching services online all year in, in Finland. And he's like studied Finnish and he is a Finnish soldier, a Finnish citizen. And he's here with us, and we love you. Yeah. And your mom and brother. I mean, uh, brother Patrick and your dad, Brian. Yeah. Um, so today our verse is 2 Corinthians 11. <clears throat> and Pastor Pete, thanks for the class. And um, we are... This is called the Apostolic Fears. To be honest, it's been one of my like like favorite, you know, like I love that title, Apostolic Fears. Second Corinthians eleven. Do apostles fear? And what do they fear? What do they fear? Do they fear death? I don't think so. Uh, persecution, I don't think so. Would they fear poverty or they fear what, COVID or what do they fear? COVID-19. What what's an apostolic fear? It's chapter 11, verse uh, 3. But I fear lest by any means as a serpent 
beguiled Eve. Uh, beguiled, the word means thoroughly beguiled. There's actually, there's like to be tricked. We have this word, pate, oh, let's see. This one is to to deceive or or uh, trick, but this one is X, but it's emphasized this word. It means he really deceived Eve. I mean, he really deceived her. I like that idea, like that people can be really deceived, you know, like you could really believe in a lie, but I mean, maybe you have your doubts or it's not that relevant, but when you're really misled, really wrong, when you, and you think you're right, this is the meaning of the word. And who did this to Eve? You can talk back to me. The serpent. Where was the serpent? In the garden. Lord, why did you let him in there? Why did you let him in there? God, why do you think he let him in there? What? To test. He wanted them to be subject to the temptation. Does God tempt anybody? You know, James 1.12, he does not tempt anybody. But he has a tempter that roams about on the earth, and he is the one that tempts. Why can't God tempt people? Because in his nature, he's not like that. Like he's so clean, he's so pure, he is so holy. Like in his nature, it's not doesn't come to his mind. He's not a deceitful person. He doesn't trick people. He's not playing a game. He's just clean, pure, true, wise. But he allows us to be subject to temptation because he wants to train us and teach us who he is and, um, uh, and teach us life as he has ordained it. Okay, so uh, let me go to the fundamental thing and you get to talk to your neighbor. This week, we have talked about how, how the church, um, remember that class we did where God is like this, and here's me, and when I think about God, I could get, it, get him wrong, remember? Like, I could get him wrong, like, when I think about God, uh, in that idea, and what we're talking about in these classes is that very truth that the apostles were very concerned that Christians would get things wrong. So we know this is very simple. We know this, but we also know that um, we've been given like a new heart, not like a new heart, we have been given a new heart, we have been given the Holy Spirit. And this is the real engine for my new life. So I can get things more or less, get them right. But m notice this doesn't say mind. What is the, what, what, how is the mind described for the Christian? The mind is what? Mind of Christ or the mind is renewed. Is the heart renewed? No, the heart is not renewed. What is the heart that we've been given? A new heart. A new heart that is, doesn't get old. The new heart is a reality that doesn't, it doesn't, it is actually the very nature of God. John, 1 John 3, 8, uh, 9, 8 and 9. It is the new birth of John 3. It's the new creation. Old things are passed away. Old things become new. It's the new heart of Ezekiel 36, 26. But we all know that our mind can go wacko. Okay? 
we can go in our mind soft, uh, in our mind legalistic, in our mind deceived. How did the serpent deceive Eve? How did he do it? By talking to her. And what happened in her mind? Her mind was getting things wrong. So the, the point of our, of our classes here and our, our teaching is just to recognize that we are living in a 21st century when, when it looks like the church, generally speaking, can really be, be immature, not equipped, not realize how wrong they can be that the church can actually be deceived and misled. It was an apostolic fear. It was a concern by the Apostle Paul that this could happen to Christians. So that's the theme, okay? So we'll get into it a little more. I mean, we'll, we'll carry on in a minute. But why don't you just for a second maybe with your neighbor, make a little list of Bible verses where, you know, we get it right and we can get it wrong. We can be right about it, we can be right on, and we can get it wrong. Okay? I'm going to... Oh. Okay. All right. So, um, here's a. Are we good? Can we? We're good now. Good. All right. How many remember up on the screen here? This man was it a Sisyphel? I don't know how you spell his name. The Sisyphel. How many know who he was? Pastor Fred, who was he? He was David's counselor, and it says that when he gave counsel, 
his words were as if he was giving the oracles of God. What happened to him? He switched sides. He betrayed David. He went with Saul in the conspiracy. Why did he do that? But there are some, I, there was, a, I read one commentary that he was the grandfather of Bathsheba. If he was a bath, grandfather of Bathsheba and he knew what David did with his granddaughter and her husband, he might have had a root of bitterness in him. I could see him betray David to get back at David. We could all see that happening in human, you know, uh, human life and life as we know it. But the point is that what if his counsel was so good, you know, where did the counsel come from, the good counsel that Azizophel had? We could say that when a man is born again, he has a new heart and a new spirit. And this is the engine for the mind. Like, this affects my mind. This is, the mind is renewed, Romans 12, 2 and 3. Now, one of our precious people, Brittany Howard, who's here today, like, we love you so much, think you're amazing. All right, so how does Brittany live in Turkey? How does she live every day? We don't really know. She's the only one that really knows. But if she walks in her new heart, then God is faithful to renew her mind. So she doesn't get familiar or extremely strange or interpret things the wrong way. But people do do that. They interpret life the wrong way. They, they have things that bother them, and they have things that disappoint them and trouble them. So this is real, like, really... Uh, uh, very profound, because uh, nearly everyone in the Bible, every man in the Bible, oh, I got the wrong, uh, let, me, let me see, um, uh, up on the screen here, we have, um, we just, you can make a list of just about everybody that you could think of. Enoch walked with God and he was not, he's maybe one that we have no record of his sin. Uh, Joseph is another one. Uh, Samuel is another one. Daniel is another one. There are some, no recorded sins, but most of them, all, I mean, I don't want to say all, but go through David and Solomon and Noah and just so many. Uh, why is it there? Because God, God has to make it clear to us that our trust cannot be in men or in our leaders. We had a very good class on that the other day. You know, was it yesterday? It was very good, wasn't it? It was so good, I'm shocked how good it was. <laughs> okay, so, uh, it's called in your book, Bishop Ryle's book, The Fallibility of Ministers. And he makes a note in there that some Christians, they have so high respect in regard for the leader that somehow they're unapproachable and also people are not correcting them and holding them accountable. And the result can be like disastrous not only for that person, but so we must invite people into our life uh, so that we are wanting them to be comfortable with us and to tell us the truth. You know, Pastor Morrison did that with me up in Marlboro because uh, he was um, diagnosed with some dementia. And um, he said, you know, how should I? I said, we can start looking for a replacement and are you in favor? Doug Wombolt was there. We were having a good time in a breakfast time. And, and, um, yeah, and so we decided that. And also I told him, I said, people are not going to tell you that you did not have a good message. They're not going to tell you that. But 
you have to go by the numbers of people. If you have 120 people in your church and it drops down to 50, that should tell you something, you know. And your elders should be able to talk to you. And they handled it in a very good way. And he did back, he did turn it over. And he was preaching sometimes. But it also can be an embarrassment when a man is losing his ability. Okay, I'm a little bit off subject, but I want to say that, that um, in our class, these last, these classes this week, we have been, we've been putting the onus on the believer to live and walk because there is a falling away. And that falling away happens for a number of reasons. And um, so this is uh, 2 Corinthians 11.3, an apostolic fear that the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. Um, that means um, very much he, he deceived Eve like she had not a clue. So your minds, there, there it is, not, he's not saying your heart, he's saying your mind should be corrupted. Why does he say mind? Because, you know, the mind is, is always changing. And, you know, of course you know that the, that the, believer, that the believer has uh, also the old sin nature, right? O-S-N. And this is the old heart. And this is the Jeremiah 17.5 part. And this is where uh, I found in my life, this is very, very interesting, and I can't emphasize it enough. It's more, my life is more about my heart. It's my heart. That's the key to my mind. It's my heart. And I've noticed a battle with familiarity in the ministry, you know, like familiarity of, of words, familiarity of messages, familiarity of people, familiarity of behaviors, doing the same thing automatically, familiarity. So I need, I want God to please help me with that because I would like this to be fresh. And it's the presence of God that makes it fresh, you know, in your heart, in your life, you know. That new heart is what affects the mind, so it's renewed. And so now you are, we could just say, uh, Psalm 119, 133, 119, 105, um, Hebrews 4.12, many verses where you can see how the Word of God cleanses you, quickens you, affects your mind, and you enjoy the Word of God. That's a problem. Uh, people can learn the Bible but not really enjoy. Like it's not honey, honey, you know. There's two comparisons, actually, uh, probably more, but two that I think of. One is the precious metals, like gold and silver. Rupees is also Proverbs 4. That's like, like money. That's value. And the other one is honey. That's like, in, that's like um, not metal. That's, like a, that's something totally different. That's like sweetness. That's, you know, honey in your mouth. So the Bible has those two values. One of them is like the solid, incredible value of metal, you know, and the other one is the experience in your mouth and the blessing of the Word of God in, your, in how it affects you and how you feel about it. Like honey, and it's all about your senses, right, in your mouth. And how you feel, you experience it. You experience it. So, uh, I, Paul had a fear that the church in Corinth, that they would also be beguiled. 
you know, tricked, misled, deceived. Now, I have a short list here from Pastor Siraji's class the other day. He said that, that people can, number one, rationalize the meaning of the Scripture. They could say, when they read the Bible, let's say, like women should be silent in the church. Remember when Paul wrote that? Women should not be talking, they should be silent in the church. So they read that in the Bible, and what, how do they rationalize it, Pastor Steve? Yeah. Yeah. They might say that was for them, or, or I don't understand that. That He didn't know about the feminist movement and um, how, how smart women are and how they can have what they can have. It's like, we, we know what you're saying. That's like, he also said contextualizing the scripture, uh, humanizing the scripture, uh, also adding doctrinal, um, def uh, defective doctrinal statements. Uh, maybe we could just say this, um, adding to the Bible, subtracting, from the Bible, and then just put here, substituting for the Bible. So, uh, when Paul was writing to the Corinthians, he was concerned that they would leave like solid doctrinal understanding that comes through a renewed mind and in, from a new heart. So the new heart allows my mind to be renewed or renews my mind. Now I hear the Bible, and now when I hear a verse like that, like women should be silent in the church, I am interested, what does God mean by that? I meditate on it. I might study it out. I might think about it, but I don't want to privately interpret it. I want to know what did God mean? when he said that, because God wrote that. You see what I mean? It's not pride, like pride in uh, the human heart, this one, the old heart, that cannot renew the mind, so the mind cannot comprehend the depths of what is said and the meaning of what is said. So that's the, that's the idea. Uh, read the verse again with me, please. Chapter 11, verse um, 3. So your mind should be corrupted. You actually have the idea of like wa wasted the mind. We, we, we have, we used to say the mind, remember the, the social, the secular a mind is a terrible thing to waste. Remember that? A mind is a terrible thing to waste, to, talking about uneducated people. Like, oh, the mind is a terrible thing to waste. What a good statement. The mind can be corrupted. So w what happens with a church when they don't have the renewed mind from the new heart? They're very vulnerable. First John 2.15 they're very vulnerable to being deceived and misled. And uh, they don't have the power, they don't have the passion, the excitement, and the personal freedom. Because that's what happens with the real Christian life, is you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Wow. I think that's the thing that I love so much about this Christian faith, is the is the freedom, the joy, the freedom from sin, the freedom from myself, the freedom from preconceived notions about things, and, and agreeing with the carnal, carnal mind. Because you just have another carnal mind with, <laughs> you know, you have a, another carnal mind with an old sin nature, and they just connect. We just connect very easily. And then we talk, we talk, and maybe we are morally good, but we cannot, 
do warfare. We are not excited about our faith. Jesus is, yeah, we believe in Jesus, but, uh, you know, there's other things that we've got to focus on. And there's no love, no passion, no desire for Jesus. So the church really loses its uh, mission, you know. So uh, go to, back to the verse. It says, your mind should be corrupted. I think I have a short list here. Uh, ungodly men creep in. Jude 4. You want to flip over there? Ungodly men creep in. There are certain men crept in unawares. When it says crept in unawares, what does it mean? Unnoticed. Unnoticed. Creeping in, slipping in, like sliding in to the leadership, sliding in, making it, going through the seminary, going to the seminary, uh, slipping in, getting a promotion in the denomination, slipping in, and, and they are polluting and affecting the organization. And it starts right away. How do we know the devil slips in? Judas Iscariot was at the Last Supper. And he was there all the time for three years. And what, what the devil, did the devil know this about, about Judas? You know what I mean? Like he, did he, did he um, you know, how did it go? The de the Judas is there and the devil kind of recognizes his, his uh, state of mind and his heart, and so he becomes a tool. That's like when I, uh, people have asked me about who is the Antichrist, I say, I don't even believe that the devil knows who the Antichrist is, because the devil doesn't know when this is going to happen. He just says, this is First John 2, 18, there are many Antichrists, and they went out from us because they were not of us. So the devil is looking for that guy. And I think Adolf Hitler was one. And when the devil found him and then was using him, uh, the devil must have enjoyed it very much. Because look at what he did for 13, 14 years destroyed a generation of German people, Europeans, for, for that, that's still recovering in a way, or in, and in a way never will, the work of the devil, you know, in the world. Okay, so, uh, do you and I realize how a whole organization can be influenced by by these um, you know by these uh, people that are have corrupted minds and the the lies and the the activity of the devil in high levels to mislead and direct a whole well whole groups of people in error yeah it's amazing. So um, you have number, let's see, we have doctrinal error. We are told about that in, in 2 Timothy 3. Uh, here in 2 Corinthians 11. We also have uh, losing the first love in uh, uh, Revelation 2. We have the end times, the Laodicean church, Revelation 3. Uh, we have ungodly men who creep in unaware in uh, Galatians 2 and, and Jude 4. And then we have the corruption of the church by immoral living. So here we have uh, a whole group of Christians 
that uh, Paul is saying they have all they're in the church and they are all living in an immoral way and every and people know about it and nobody says anything it's called they can even say they're great Christians this is called an antinomianism is when there is no law nomianism it means it's a teaching that you can like sin is not in the teaching we don't teach about sin it's not about sin it's about love it's not about the bible like that way it's about us loving each other living a good life uh, having a nice time knowing each other it can be social it can be social and immoral and nobody says anything about it there's nothing no conviction about it what is it it's just another form of the old sin nature and who did it the devil the by paul is saying that the mind is corrupted into accepting and believing what in my old sin nature i am living in my mind is not sharp it's not renewed it's not persuaded it's not holy it's not convicted and i don't want to hear about it and so the church can be like filled 80 percent of the church can be filled with these people and so a, a person looking for god may come into the church and look around and just say i i don't know i'm you know i mean this is a nice people these are nice people and this is a nice place and the building is beautiful etc but you know actually okay this is all the church is okay i think i'm going to play softball on sunday you know i i get just as much out of a saw in a dugout at a softball team than i do in in a church you know that's like a guy thing like guys aren't may not be into that like a social thing they'd rather play a sport or 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 play chess or something but to hang out with a, bu a bunch of people in a dead church it, you will have a falling away of men first the men are going and then of course the women as well but it's it, it's just the destroy it's the Ameri it's it's happening everywhere and why isn't there a ministry why isn't there a ministry from the holy spirit why isn't there you know so make a short list and talk to your neighbor about it. We're going to finish up in a few minutes. Why isn't there?
Oh, okay. Okay, how many of you have, you have a lot to say? You have a lot to say? Huh? Yes. Um, how should we do this? I think you do have a lot to say. Um, 1 Timothy 4 says, the Spirit speaks expressly. It means that Paul is saying, I'm, I'm really clear about this. The Spirit is telling me that in the latter days, some shall depart from the faith. And so they will give heed to seducing spirits. So a spirit will, can seduce or draw a man by, by reason, you know, by simple, under, you know, like... What, what did we say, this one, um, this guy, this guy, the, the guy that betrayed David, he could, he could uh, be seduced into believing this, uh, that, that he's actually making a good decision. He is making a good decision. Um, um, I think Solomon was seduced by, by you know, in a, by politics, human conventional wisdom and with with the women but it was deeper than just the women i think it was more it was political and practical like it was how he secured his kingdom was by having these foreign women in his house so that he had the security because the father of the daughter is not going to attack him if his daughter lives in jerusalem right now so uh, seducing, it means human reason. But what's lacking using our board here is that the mind renewed from the new heart and the Holy Spirit is helping us walk with God in such a way when we are seduced, we recognize that. Like that devil is talking to me, I know that. Or that's a very practical thing, but I don't see it from God. I don't have peace about it. I don't accept that. That's not from God, you see. There's a discerning capability. And if the church loses that discernment, then it's just a matter of time where the opinions of the world and the powerful people in the organization that are leaders that can lead uh, lead the, the church in the wrong way. And was this an apostolic fear? It was. He was afraid this could happen. In the same way that the devil misled Eve, he said that you, that some of you, would have a corrupt mind. And, um, the, you know, so... Uh, uh, I think I I think I addressed the the answer to it. I think so. Like you have to have your own life with God in such a way that these two things are happening on a regular, consistent basis. That I I confess my sin, I admit to God, I bring before Him in humility my heart, my corrupt or old heart that is deceitful, and I trust you, Lord, that you've given me this new heart, and I want to keep walk in my new heart, Proverbs 4. Keep it with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. This new heart will renew my mind in my life, and I'll be receptive to truth and enjoy it. Like receive holiness, walk in the holiness, and enjoy that in, in holy fellowship. You know, holy fellowship that will be discerning the error. Now, another point, Jesus was surprised, sometimes it seems like that, when the disciples didn't really spiritually show up. 
like you guys, you, you don't get it. You don't know it. How about this one? When he said, one of you will betray me. And guess what nobody said? Is it Judas? Nobody said that. Is it Judas? Why didn't they say that? They didn't, you know, they didn't know. They didn't think about that. They didn't recognize it. Did Jesus know it? Jesus knew it, but they didn't. Is, is it something like the church that Jesus knows and the church doesn't know? The church doesn't know. How, how can we live in an evil world with all the things that are going on and many possibilities of being misled and, and not have any way? Why wouldn't God train us? And isn't that the point that he gives us, pastor, teacher, our Bible, and body life, and as we walk in this. Now, our vulnerability as believers is that I go through the motion, but I'm not living in my new heart. <laughs> I'm in the wrong pen. I'm not living in my, you know, I'm not, I'm just living as a Christian in my old heart. You know, and I go through the motions. I bring my kids to Sunday school. I, I listen to a message. Uh, I love the, did you see the Adirondack chairs outside? And a latte coffees. And, and man, this is a great show. I got friends from long ago. And But look at where, what's happened in my heart. And as a pastor, in my heart, right? That's, that's really possible. That's really possible. So, you know, any closing comment? Pastor Mike, you want to say anything? I opened this up. I opened this up by bringing you up <laughs> at the China churches. You're sitting over here in America thinking of your China churches and how are they doing. Pastor Chabelli has huge responsibility. He's sitting here thinking of African churches. And I have that too. And I, you know, and I don't trust anybody. I don't trust anybody. I don't care who you are. You can be this guy up on the screen, the top guy. When he speaks, it's like the oracles of God. Yeah, well, I'll tell you. you give him 48 hours in his old heart. And what, how, what kind of mind he might have and what he might be open up to and how, who his friends are and, and who comes into the picture. And you could have a totally, you could have a dishonest a man uh, di not loyal to his wife, seduced by a woman. You could have a person that's going off on their doctrine and everything, all of it happening. And we have seen it. And it happens. And as I sit here, uh, it can be happening. I say this not to alarm us, but just to say, hey, why did he say, I fear? But because he knew how this could, could go. The Galatians, you know, they were leaving the gospel. The Corinthians were very immature and incapable of handling questions about uh, marriage and other things. So money, and um, these are the things Billy Graham said that they had the most problem with was women and money. Uh, we could say leaders get isolated, leaders get protected by their little team, and they're not being confronted and challenged and held accountable. And we must teach that the leader uh, must be held accountable. So that'll check his heart. So he'll say, I got caught. Forgive me. And I want to be restored. And I remember the days when I was young, spirit-filled, fresh, excited, passionate, soul-winning, broken, humble servant. I remember that, and I want to return to that. Okay? 
Any question or comment? Pastor Mike, I didn't give you a chance. Okay. Yes. In a word, my answer would be, can you say to somebody, you are off, you are wrong, can you say those words to a leader? Listen, you know, I love you, I'm, I'm your pastor. Here's the question, am I your pastor? Another title, am I your spiritual father? I am telling you, you are off. You don't even know it, but you are off. Are you off, you know? No, I'm not off. Now, now we got a problem because I believe you are. Actually, I know you are, but you're not listening to me. So that leader could go uh, run, run, um, you know, leave and take his whole church with him. Yeah, take his whole thing, everything that he's doing, you could take him away, and he's not part of you anymore. Like, or, and he can tell his leaders that you are wrong, and this is what you said to him, and it's totally not right, you know. So you want to be sure you are right if you hold him accountable, and if he is wrong, you need to have actually real evidence is that he is. The problem can be that he could be wrong, um, but there may not be so evidences. Um, you know, a woman would have to come forward and say money would have to be missing. There has to be real evidences because we cannot, uh, we cannot accuse an elder without witnesses and without real evidences. But there's another softer thing, and that is, are you are your spirit is not right. The way you are acting, the way you are talking to people, that is not right. I guess my primary point to address your question is, can you, as a leader, do you have the authority and the way and the manner to rebuke? Because Paul said to Timothy, you must rebuke, reprove, exhort with all authority. You know, like it really happened. Titus was to s stop their mouths. I believe it's Titus chapter 1, verse uh, 9 and 10. Their mouths must be stopped. So Titus was to exhort them and rebuke them. Uh, the problem is with each other, let's say me and Pastor Shabelli or Pastor Hadley or any of us older guys, when we are together and we are loving and respecting each other, we are not very, you know, it's like we're not w walking around looking to exhort or correct or to say you're off. But I think we would be wrong if we totally remove that from our relationships. If we could never do that, I don't think that's correct. I think we should be mature enough to be able to exhort, rebuke, and lovingly correct each other. You know, it's a little bit of a, uh, a you know, um, sensitive subject because we don't want to be walking or judging we want to be encouraging and edifying. But I, I picked up on this. I have a problem with it because I'm not so easily, I'm not looking for confrontation. I'm not looking for it. But can I have it? Yes. Because what there's a lot at stake. And if that brother can be restored or corrected or helped, then I must do it. A friend, right, how's it go? Faithful are the wounds of a friend, yeah. 
And so it can be done in the right way. Without error against Galatians 6, 1, spirit of meekness, but we should be able to say, you know, I, this isn't the right, you know, let's go to God and get right with God. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. I needed that. Thank you. Actually, if we're able to do it, people may trust us more in our leadership. You know, but if I'm always the nice guy, always agreeing with everything, you know, that might not be really what people are, what, what is needed, right? So is that, is that a good uh, way to say it? Yes. Especially, Pastor Mike said, before the confrontation, there might be a lot of work in the relationship. And I mean, that's like, that's like um, this uh, picture we drew the other day, and it goes like this. <clears throat> um, here's a person, and how do I know the person? I might not know them very well. I might not know them this way, meaning... I know a little bit about them in the right way, but some of what I think about them isn't right. I project on them something of my own understanding about that person. So I might not really know that person very well. You know, this happens to all of us. So when I go to them, I could be misunderstanding them. So that's what you mean by uh, I might have to work in the relationship to make sure not only I know them, but they also know me. And of course, when you're a leader and people don't really know you that well, then, then that we run the risk of um, offending them. They may not know our heart, why we say what we say, why we're talking to them. So maybe it's seen in the fact that Jesus had only 12 men that he was very close with. Actually, 11. And ba basically, out of the 11, there was three, you know, that he was very close with, that he, you know. So that means maybe I should not be walking around. I should not be like, you know, I should be wise and the spirit led and loving and investing in people way before I'm correcting them. But I'm talk we're talking I think about a leader that has a good he has a great ministry and he gets off and he needs somebody to sit down and talk to him and just say, wait a minute, I don't know if things are right here. Help me understand this, you know. You know what I mean? Like, here's a big thing about women, men and women, pastors and women. We are taught not to be with a woman alone. That's what we're taught. Are you embracing that? Yes. Ten years later, not. Why did you change? Why aren't you doing that anymore? Because I don't have a problem in that area. Because, uh, um, you know, it's, I think it's childish because, uh, and then on and on it goes, you know. Like, well, wait, wait, maybe is it, could there be something here that, that there's even more about this that you are, you know, let's get, let's get as humble, as close to God as we can. Let's have the new heart. You know, I, I don't know, I'm just talking. I, just, I got one more little thing to say that shows the heart. When, when I said to a colleague of mine, uh, they talked to me about Bible college up in Maine when they went to Bible, they, they didn't have a good attitude about it. And I said, I, it's funny, I, those years were very important to me. That Bible college I went to was, I, I mean, that's sacred. That's sacred. Don't ever make fun of it. Don't ever 
like talk about it in a degrading way. It never, like that Bible college was like, I learned so much. I went to Finland and changed, affected a whole because of God and what I learned in Bible college. That was the, that was amazing. So, so why, why do they look at the past with a, with a, like that, that thing? It, to me, it's the old heart. You know, how about my wife? How do I think of my wife? You know, I have my new heart that I love my wife more and more because I have a new heart, you know. Well, the relationship can go bad, and you can get tired of your wife, and she's tired of you, and then you start thinking weird things and, and the whole thing. But wait a minute, wait a minute. You do that, that's not right. What happened? Is you, you don't, it's the heart, you know, the heart. It might be hard, but, but go to God. You know what I mean? So... If we let people get away with the flesh, and we do, but we realize I want to be, 2 Timothy 2, 22, 23, 24, a vessel, there are many vessels in a house, Some to put it in our modern day English, there's paper cups, there's like throwaway styrofoam cups, they're like throwaway, and then there are those special thermoses stainless steel and 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 you decide you decide what vessel you are and you purge yourself from the vessels of dishonor and you hang around with the people of honor you hang out you spend time with the people of honor because that's how you you grow and mature Okay, so that's it. Pastor Shabelli, did you want to say anything? You do an amazing job. He has a huge job because he has, he has all of this. Go, the human, but we got to say to the glory of God, God is faithful, amen? And any African brother is humble, and many, many of them are very humble, and they have this thing. And same with any of us anywhere in the world, you know. Okay. I like just the idea of um, talking about the point of view that distinguish what's of God and what's not of God, you know? And that just comes through the filling of the Spirit, first Corinthians two, fourteen through sixteen, and then the word, Hebrews five, eleven through fifteen, the grace given, the spirit of grace that is there. And I just I look at this point of talk of Paul who is here's what seems to be okay. These are the servants of the most high God. Yeah. Yeah. We're not operating in right. truth, you know? That was painful because you grew up with these people and you lived with them from the time you just came into the church. Right. Ate pizza, but they had, what had happened? And I think um, that's where success came from. Okay. Success. You, success and, and you have the flesh, right? And you have success. You got 700 people, you got buildings, you've got money coming in, you've got popularity, acceptance, and everything. But at the heart of it, there was adultery, there was like dishonesty, and what? The basics were gone. No more Bible school, no more evangelism. Yeah. Very no, well, well, here is a good point. When do you check yourself? Like, remember in David's life, when he, he cut the robe of Saul, his heart smote him, okay? So he checked himself right away. 
But in those cases, and this is what happens, it just keeps rolling. And even the pastor might say, how do I get out of this? I don't even know how to get out of this. Like, I'm in trouble. Like, I've, I've got a girlfriend, I've got a marriage, and then I've got a girlfriend going on, and i got this church, and i got to preach on Sunday. You might say, how could a man be wrong so much and be preaching on Sunday? Right? What, what's the answer to the question? This one, also nature with a mind that is corrupted, and he, he can't find his way. He might even say, I don't even know how to find God. That's amazing. I mean, I believe it. I don't even know what to do. I don't know how to find God. I'm riding a tiger. Do you know what it means when a, when a dictator is riding a tiger? A dictator in power, they say it is a saying, they're riding a tiger. They can't get off the tiger because the tiger will eat them. They got to stay on it. And a pastor in a church with this whole thing going, and he realizes he's in trouble, he's got to stay in there. He's got to keep covering it. He's got to keep lying. He's got to lie to himself, and he's going to keep preaching, and he's going to keep leading. And you might say, how did he ever get there? Well, you have no idea what you are capable of. You have no idea how wrong you can be and continue in it. You, you will sell your mother for a dollar. You will lie to a pastor. You will lie. You will leave greater grace. You will do any. You, you, are, you and I are capable of incredible things. So what's the answer? I think it's come to something like a credit card. You buy something with a credit card and you pay it off within 30 days. Just get it right. Pay it off. Just pay off your credit card if you can. Most people can't, so they don't. They can't. Keep short accounts. When you are wrong, get corrected right away. Don't let it roll over. Don't, don't let it go. It'll grow. Yeah. And there was no remedy. I think it's the end of, isn't it? The last end of Second Chronicles. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. I think sometimes uh, you just have to, the, I don't know, if we, I could see a man in trouble 
he's in trouble and he just wants to get out and he just, you know, um, does. He gets out. Do you ever remember Pastor Stephen saying, you know, just get out of the ministry? Like, if you're going to live like that, just get out. Anybody remember that? Remember it? What did he say? Yes, and, and I remember that phrase, get out of the ministry. If you're going to live like that, get out of the ministry. And I mean, it brings shame. It brings shame in the ministry. So you've got two, uh, two things. One is encouraging people in the ministry, restoring them. And the other one is, you know, just get out of it. It's not, you know, you're going to live like that, then just get out of it. Don't bring shame, reproach on the name of Christ, you know. And there are guys that are, you know, that's maybe what they should do, you know. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I know that there is a better, the better answer is this one with renewed, and enjoying what we're doing. Learn how to do it the right way, like in the Lord as a servant, and do not aspire to a place of authority or high position for the sake of that. But let God put you where he wants you to be and enjoy where you are and, and walk in him. And God will, God will exalt you in due time. He will do his work, you know. But ambition is a problem, too. So anyway, that's good. Amen. That's it. God bless you.